what I thought I'd do today is, uh, is sort of drill down into one specific aspect of, of Chiari, since Chiari is such a, a huge topic, um, and uh, get into a little bit more detail about this issue about Chiari and its relationship with scoliosis. Uh, which, as you'll see, uh, sounds like it would be a relatively simple issue, but I think we can, we can make it complicated despite all of our efforts to try and uh, keep it simple. Uh, so Dr. Heiss in his uh, presentation today was talking about, well, who's going to benefit from Chiari surgery? And I think that's a, it's a very complicated question. What it really boils down to for me is, well, people who are symptomatic from their Chiari are going to benefit from Chiari surgery. So then you get into the much more complicated issue of, of what are symptoms. And, uh, and one of these uh, potential symptoms that, uh, that's discussed frequently is scoliosis. So this is a patient with, uh, with scoliosis, and not unfrequently somebody like this will, will get an MRI scan these days. Is there a pointer up here? Here it is. And, uh, and we'll see a Chiari malformation. So what do we do with this information? Does this make it a symptomatic Chiari? Should we be doing a Chiari decompression for this patient, or do we need more information? Well, I think that's, uh, that's complicated. So what's the evidence? Well, actually, as I'll show you, there's fairly good evidence for linking Chiari with syringomyelia. That's not a surprise to anybody in the room here today. And for linking syringomyelia with scoliosis. Okay. So this is the easy part. And that evidence comes in the form of lots and lots of clinical series. I'm just showing you several examples here. I'm not going to get into any details about most of these. Most of these papers, are, are they're all good papers. They're all basically the same thing. They're talking about some individual surgeon's clinical series where they do Chiari decompression surgery on somebody with a Chiari malformation and syringomyelia and scoliosis. And they generally show progression of scoliosis in some patients, improvement of scoliosis in some patients, and no change in some patients. It's a very mixed bag in terms of the results. Nevertheless, most of these papers conclude the same thing, that the Chiari decompression is indicated because you can't imagine how much worse it would have been if we didn't do it. And that's sort of speculative, but it's, it's also fairly well accepted. There's some other evidence supporting that speculation, though. This is taken from the McGirt paper, which came out recently. Uh, recently, meaning two or three years ago, in Journal of Neurosurgery. And here it's looking at the time course of people who worsened or got better. Here on the left side of the screen, you can see that it takes several years for this to become apparent in some patients. But there's a really big difference. If you look at this graph here on the right side of the screen, there's a really big difference in outcome between people whose searings got better and their, if their scoliosis got better. If the searings got better with Chiari decompression, in general, their scoliosis at least didn't progress. Whereas if the searings didn't improve, they're at much, much greater risk for scoliosis progressing. So evidence like this supports our, our general notion, again, the Chiari uh, can lead to searings and searings can lead to scoliosis. Same thing here, this is a, a nice paper uh, from here in Los Angeles, again, showing this link. And, and these uh, authors concluded the same thing as a lot of other authors have concluded, that in general, the younger patients do better and those with the less severe Cobb angles, that is to say, less severe scoliosis, uh, do better. This is a paper from Dr. Iskandar. It's a survey he conducted back in 2006. I think it's a really nice survey. They, they asked members of the main pediatric neurosurgery organization if they would operate on a Chiari malformation under lots of different circumstances. And in one particular circumstance that he gave the group, he said there'd be tonsils at one millimeter, or sorry, one centimeter below the foramen magnum. There'd be a large syrinx and there was scoliosis. And 83% of this group said they would operate on that patient. So this is not terribly controversial. Again, the Chiari, the syrinx, and the scoliosis. Now this, in my opinion, is controversial. What if there's no syrinx? What if you just have the Chiari and scoliosis, and you've got a good MRI scan of the spine, and you don't see any significant syrinx in the spine? Can you honestly tell that person, that family, that they should have a Chiari decompression for the scoliosis. Let's say they're otherwise asymptomatic. And the answer to that, I think, is very much less clear. Several people have made this argument, though, and in fact, in most of our major textbooks, it's acknowledged that this is something that's reasonable to do. So the first argument goes something like this. Some children with scoliosis have low tonsils on imaging, even without a syrinx. So there's an intersection of a population that have Chiari and a population that have scoliosis. Uh, 
And there's lots of examples of articles that have been written essentially showing this. Most of these papers are from the orthopedic literature. Uh, in fact, I think all of the examples I'm showing you here are from the orthopedic literature. The methods are always the same. It's 300 patients, 200 patients that are all go undergoing scoliosis surgery by a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and they all got MRIs and they found Chiari in some patients. Now these papers have been purporting to show that this association implies a cause and effect relationship. And I'll show you why I think that that's not the case. Here's one example, a, a very recent example of a very large series of scoliosis patients, 923 patients. And they did MRI scans on these patients and found 12 Chiari malformations, uh, which is given as 30% of the neurological abnormalities, but again, it's a much lower percentage of the overall group with scoliosis. And actually, I would argue that even in a population of normals, we'd expect to find a significantly higher percentage of Chiari malformation. So these authors concluded there's an association. I would actually say that this paper really doesn't show much of anything. I threw this slide in at the last minute uh, because this morning there was this, uh, this uh, suggestion of where did the five millimeter definition come from? Does it make any sense at all? And, and that is tangentially important for this whole scoliosis argument, as I'll show. Uh, the, the five millimeter uh, definition, I think, really came to the fore in the mid 80s uh, when MRI scanning was being used more and more and more frequently and radiologists were starting to see more and more of these things and they decided they needed some sort of objective definition. So there were a few different papers all at about the same time that, uh, that attempted to study this issue. This is, I think, the most cited one. It's by Barkovich and others. And they studied a, a really tiny number of patients. They drew a whole lot of conclusions off a relatively small group. And I think they did the best they could at the time. Again, this is the sort of the dawn of the MRI era. But they had 25 Chiari patients. 25 Chiari patients is what they're going to draw a lot of conclusions off of. And, and 20, 200 patients that were pre-selected by them for being normal, and then they decided to compare these groups. And what they found, they used different cut points here, as you can see in the lower part of the screen. Here's zero, that's tonsils at the frame and magnum, minus one millimeter below the frame and magnum, and so on, down to minus five. And according to these authors, back in 1986, if they used this five millimeter cut point, they thought that it was 100% specific for symptomatic Chiari malformation. That's not their subjective definition of Chiari on MRI. They were saying this is 100% specific for symptomatic Chiari malformation. And I don't think there's any neurosurgeon in this room right now that thinks that's even slightly plausible. Uh, but his papers, this paper and a couple others like it uh, that I think really established this definition for us. Well, there's, there's a lot of problems with that definition. This is the uh, Meadows article from Johns Hopkins that's already been cited uh, once today showing that there's a 0.9% prevalence of Chiari on MR imaging if you image an entire population. We, we've studied this a number of different ways. And actually, if you study children, that number is higher. When we looked at our group of, uh, of 14,000 children undergoing imaging, we found a, a higher prevalence and we were disturbed by that at first. Well, why could that be? Selection bias and so on, it's all possible. But, but as I'll show you later, I think some of it is that Chiari prevalence changes according to age. And if you study mostly adults, as this group did, you're gonna find a lower prevalence than if you study uh, mostly children. So again, I, I showed you that it's not uncommon for somebody with scoliosis now to get MR imaging. This is a trend that we're just seeing across the board in, in pediatric neurosurgery. Uh, it's a great article from the Journal of the American Medical Association last year. It's just showing essentially what's going on in, in America right now with obtaining MRI imaging for all sorts of conditions. This isn't a Chiari paper. This is just who's getting MRI imaging in America. And you can see the trend. Here's uh, 20 per 1,000 enrollees in 1996. And now you can see up here in some regions as high as 80 uh, per 1,000 enrollees. So just in the last decade, you've seen a tremendous jump in the number of people who are having MRI scans. So we're seeing an awful lot more of this than we used to, and that's why. And incidentally, all these different lines represent different parts of the country, different regions. So you can see, actually, your likelihood of getting an MRI scan varies considerably based on just where you live. Okay, people in Beverly Hills, California, are going to have a much different rate of obtaining MR imaging than people who live in Iowa. It's just a fact, and it's been studied. The United States in general obtains much more MR imaging than people in other countries. This is uh, data that I took from the OECD, the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development. 
and they look at health trends around the world, the average in developed nations is here in the red line, 41 per uh, 1,000. The United States up here at 91 in 2011, so over twice the average, were three times the average of Canada. So if you lived in Canada, you would have about a one-third chance of getting an MRI scan compared to the average American. Same thing for somebody from Britain. So this issue of people showing up in the clinic with MRI scans that we really aren't sure what to do with sometimes is, is really a distinctly American problem. And so we're seeing this. We're seeing this intersection between Chiari and scoliosis. Well, here's another argument. Chiari decompression can improve scoliosis curve in some patients. Again, this comes from those case series that I showed you at first where people are doing Chiari decompressions and the scoliosis is getting better. And in some of those case series, there's one or two people that didn't have a syrinx. And they're saying, well, maybe this person got better too. But it's always a small number of people. And these are, these are great neurosurgery groups that I have a lot of respect for, but there's a few case reports out there that have shown this as well. Chiari, no syrinx, scoliosis. The scoliosis didn't get worse or, or maybe even got a little bit better if you do the Chiari decompression. But these are case reports. And for a condition as common as Chiari on MRI scan, I would suggest to you that individual case reports are not valuable in terms of guiding our practice because you can find an example of almost everything associated with a Chiari once or twice. So getting to uh, what Dr. Keating uh, was discussing a little bit earlier this morning, natural history. You can study Chiari natural history a million different ways. In general, different age groups with sp uh, respect to specific symptoms and so on. And here's just a, a subgroup of our natural history uh, analysis, uh, which we came up with after that, uh, that publication that was shown this morning. 55 patients with Chiari and scoliosis. They all met our usual definitions in our papers, which is five millimeters of tonsil position below the foramen magnum. I try not to say tonsil herniation because I think that has a negative connotation for neurosurgeons. Greater than 10 degree curve is our definition of scoliosis. That's standard in the orthopedic literature. Everybody had to have at least one year of follow-up or they weren't even included in the group. The initial decision was for conservative management. That's how they, they were admitted to this group. So if we saw them and we thought they were in trouble and they got surgery, they were not part of the natural history analysis. Uh, a lot of data on this slide that I don't have time to go into, but the point is there was, there was a between three and, and about six years of follow-up in this group. Here's the bottom line. It's a small group of patients, but it's, it's the largest uh, that anybody's done in this particular subgroup. Uh, most people stayed the same. A small number of people progressed. A couple people regressed. Two out of 54 regressing is nothing to get really excited about. But back to that point about case reports. If we're in the business of writing case reports, well, both of these people had a Chiari and no syrinx and got better. And if we operated on them, that would be our case report, that Chiari decompression fixes these people. And it's just not true. Again, uh, regression. Neither of these patients had a syrinx. So here's another argument. Children with scoliosis frequently have tonsils below the foramen magnum. This also comes mostly from the orthopedic literature. This is a paper, Chang and others from Spine, which is uh, mainly an orthopedic journal. Uh, sorry, Dr. Holly, probably spine, neurosurgery, spine surgeons probably read it too. But it's mainly an orthopedic journal. Um, and this is an orthopedic scoliosis surgeon who did the same thing that the other orthopedic surgeons are doing. They're scanning their scoliosis population with MRI scans. And this is the curve that he found, uh, which I think surprised him. He, he found that a large number of his patients with scoliosis have tonsils below the foramen magnum, represented by this hash line here. That's the foramen magnum line. And so these patients are below the foramen magnum. Notice this curve. It's a nice normal curve, Gaussian distribution, and it seems to fall easily down below the frame and magnum. Now he concluded that this was because he was studying a scoliosis population and therefore scoliosis patients were more likely to have Chiari malformation. They even went farther than that and suggested that less than five millimeters of tonsillar descent should be used as a basis for Chiari decompression in these patients. But there were a number of problems with that paper. Uh, tonsil position wasn't studied by age. It's never been properly defined, certainly not before that paper was ever done. So in my opinion, they had no good control group. Uh, this is uh, an article that we just wrote. It's in uh, Journal of Neurosurgery uh, as of last month. Uh, and this is basically tonsillar position by age. I think you need to know this information if you're going to draw any conclusions about whether somebody is abnormal or not. You need to know what's out there in the normal population. 
So this is uh, essentially from a group of 65,000 patients uh, that we had in our database undergoing MRI. We randomly selected uh, 2,400 of them for direct observation. We read their MRI scans. Uh, the top graph is all 2,400 in every age cohort from zero up to 71 plus. The bottom line is where we excluded known Chiari patients trying to mitigate a selection bias as much as possible. You can see the curves are essentially the same though. And tonsil position changes dramatically uh, by age. You can see the tonsil position goes a little bit down over the first couple of decades of life and then pretty steadily rises over the course of one's life. So depending on what age group you're studying, the prevalence of Chiari malformation, at least on imaging, is gonna be drastically different. Furthermore, when people talk about symptomatic Chiari, it, it tends to be mostly in these age groups too, which I think is probably not a coincidence. This was uh, the best prior data that we had. This is an article that's frequently cited. It's by McCoolis and others, 1992 paper. Uh, this is their well-known graph purporting to show that tonsil position rises dramatically during childhood, is fairly steady during adulthood, and rises dramatically in, in later life. Um, this happens in some patients, but it's certainly not the average trend in most patients. This is their actual data. So this is what they kind of imagined was happening, but these are the data. I mean, these little dots are what they had. They had 18 patients in some of their decade cohorts, 30 in the largest number. And what they could figure out statistically is that there was a little bit of a incline there, that your tonsils tended to get a little bit higher over the course of your life. And, and from these data, they came up with this, um, which I don't think was, was the reality. I think I would at least suggest to you that this is more the reality on average. If you dig a little deeper, you find that the age-to-age -age cohorts all follow this normal distribution. I showed you that spine paper, the orthopedic spine paper with the Gaussian distribution of tonsil position, and that's essentially what we found too, but it changes by decade. I'm just, uh, this isn't the main point of the talk to this. I'm just showing you a couple of these decades, but the tonsil position changes depending what age group you're studying. Okay, so it goes up as people get older into adulthood, but it's always relatively normal looking in its distribution, okay, which I think is important. Getting off the scoliosis topic for just a second, scientists look at these sort of normal distributions. They consider it important when they're looking at different morphometric measurements of a species, especially paleobiologists, if they find dinosaur bones and they're trying to decide, is this dinosaur in the same species as that dinosaur? Well, you, it's difficult to study the species DNA, so they study dimensions of their measurements and they make these curves. And if, it's, if they all fall on a single curve, they view that as evidence that they're all in the same species. And if they have two different normal curves, they say, well, this is evidence that they're two different species that we're studying the bones of. So you can make statistical definitions that you're actually studying the same population, the same kind of group, just by looking at these normal curves. And again, the normal curve is what we're finding for tonsil position. We're not finding two separate groups. Again, just same point one curve versus this two curve distribution arguing for two populations. In the human species, we follow normal curves for our morphometric measurements, okay? This is birth weight, just randomly selected infants looking at their birth weights, and again, a fairly normal curve as you would expect. Distribution of male height, a completely normal curve as you would expect. And I would suggest to you that tonsil position is also a morphometric measurement and follows a normal curve. Different species. This is voting records in the U.S. Senate, just to sort of make the point that it doesn't have to be like this, and you can see the two different parties. There's no connection there. They're absolutely 100% different species, you could say there. So not a normal curve. And it's important if you're comparing these two. I mean, are they the same? Are they different? This is different. This is a different group. So again, Chiari patients. We found it. This orthopedic spine group found it. Normal distribution. I threw this in this morning as well because there was some discussion about the genetics of Chiari malformation, which I think is a, a really important uh, point uh, to make. And I, I think that this tonsil distribution does at least have some relevance for this whole discussion about is there a Chiari gene and so on. And what most scientists, I think, would tell you is if you find a normal distribution like this, what this at least implies is that there's a, a large number of independent determinants of this variable. 
right? If there's one determinant of the variable, then you get the two distributions. If there's two or three, you're going to get different, different, different distributions. But we don't have that. We have a relatively normal distribution. So based on this, you would predict lots of determinants of Chiari malformation, which again, I think is supported by some of the other data that you've heard today. Um, and not to sound too pessimistic, but if I look at this, I would predict that there's not going to be a Chiari gene. It's not going to be one, at least, and I feel that it's very unlikely we'll find two or three or four. Maybe there's 100 Chiari genes that we need to define that are all relevant for individual families uh, or large groups of families, but I don't think we're going to find the holy grail of the one Chiari gene. I just don't think that makes sense based on this distribution. So finally, uh, I'll just show you another little statistical analysis we did. Again, looking at this uh, uh, relatively controversial idea of can this cause this without this, okay? And so to do that, we, we did a, a, a multifactorial analysis uh, looking at all of these determinants individually. So we looked at our group of uh, about 14,000 children. We studied all of their... Uh, histories and scans. We have 509 Chiari patients in the group, 347 have a syrinx. There were 17, or sorry, 1,700 or so patients with scoliosis uh, in the group. Of the Chiari malformation, uh, 117 had a syrinx, 391 had no syrinx, and so on. You get the idea. We split these groups up into a lot of different categories until we could try to build an, a case for independent uh, determination. So when we looked at the odds ratios of scoliosis versus Chiari, this is what we came up with. Uh, the odds ratio, if you have a Chiari, what this number means, 2.02, it means if you have a Chiari in our population, you are twice as likely to have scoliosis. But this is not multifactorial yet. This is just those two variables. So we all get that people that have a Chiari have an association with scoliosis. That much we already knew, but we can, can we take it then to the next step? Uh, scoliosis and syrinx, also a very, very powerful odds ratio. People with a syrinx were eight times more likely to have scoliosis than people without a syrinx. So this is a really strong determinant. Uh, female gender also had a positive odds ratio for scoliosis. But what about the multivariate analysis that I was talking about? So scoliosis is our outcome variable, and we had these as our predictors or covariates, age, gender, Chiari status, and Searing status. So that means that if, if three of these things matter, but one of them doesn't, then we can tease that out in the multifactorial analysis, right? And here's what we came up with. Here's the data. Taking them one at a time, not surprisingly, Searing was still really important for predicting whether or not you're going to have scoliosis. The odds ratio used to be 8. On the multifactorial odds ratio, it's down to 7.6. So it's still a really important predictor of whether there's going to be scoliosis. Gender, uh, a little bit uh, important. Age, not very important at all. You can see that it still ended up being significant because we had a large number of patients. But look at this odds ratio, 1.02. So not that important, really. Um, but here's, in my opinion, the, the relevance of, of this study. Here's the, the big thing. Um, the Chiari odds ratio, although it had a positive odds ratio, uh, it was not significant. And look at this confidence limit. Here's why it wasn't significant. The confidence limit crosses one. And what I mean by that is that if, if somebody asks you, well, based on these data, what, what does it mean? Is there a 95% chance it's going to be associated with scoliosis or not associated with scoliosis, then there's a 95% chance it either protects you from getting scoliosis or causes scoliosis. It crosses that one line. Does that make sense to everybody? So in other words, there's only a slightly greater chance that it has a positive association than it actually has a negative association. Um, furthermore, if you, I didn't include this slide, but if you turn this number into a number needed to treat, your number needed to treat is astronomically high. So maybe there's somebody out there that's going to benefit from a Chiari decompression without a searing scoliosis. But trying to identify that one person out of all of the other people that are undergoing unnecessary surgery from you is going to be really hard to prove. Uh, just showing the, uh, the betas here for any statisticians in the audience. Um, so back to the question, can Chiari cause scoliosis in the absence of the searing? I think based on all of the reasons I showed you today, looking at the question in a number of different ways, I think that I'm not convinced, and, and for me personally right now, I'm not recommending Chiari decompression for patients with Chiari, no syrinx, 
and scoliosis as their one and only symptom. So if that's my only reason for offering them an operation, I won't do it uh, if, if there's no spinal serix. So to conclude, uh, MRI prevalence of Chiari varies by age. Prevalence estimates, and, and I think this is really important because we see these prevalence estimates given all the time of 1% or 0.9%, but I think prevalence estimates have to take age into consideration. You have to define what age group you're talking about. Normal, the definition of normal, varies substantially by age and should be expected to change during an individual's lifetime. And in general, tonsils are lowest, the second to fourth decades of life. This sort of corresponds with when we're seeing a lot of our symptomatic Chiari patients. Uh, I can't really speak to that, except that I, it seems like that's probably not a coincidence. Like most morphometric measurements, cerebellar tonsil position follows a normal distribution or a near normal distribution. And this sort of gets back to what uh, Dr. Iskandar was talking about. In his Chiari 1 talk, he was essentially saying the converse of what I'm saying now. He was saying, you know, there's, there are symptomatic patients out there, real symptomatic patients out there that don't meet the Chiari 1 definition because they have less than five millimeters of tonsil descent. In other words, tonsil descent isn't the whole thing. We shouldn't be talking about that so much. Well, here's the converse of that, which is to say that five, greater than five millimeters isn't necessarily pathological. Okay, there are lots of people with more than five millimeters of tonsillar descent that don't have symptoms. There are some people with less than five millimeters that do have symptoms. So this five millimeter definition is completely artificial. It's based on really bad data from a couple of decades ago, uh, and it probably should be thrown out. Five millimeters is the low end of a normal distribution. It's associated with symptoms in some, but not most individuals. Chiari is definitely associated with syrinx. Syrinx is definitely associated with scoliosis, but there is no strong independent association between Chiari and scoliosis in the absence of a syrinx. So most of the data that I showed you today was based off our imaging database. Uh, therefore, there's a selection bias. We're not studying a normal population. We're studying people that came to our institution for one reason or another. Uh, also, we're examining association, so we're trying to make assumptions about cause and effect by looking at association, and association is not the same thing as causation. Uh, nevertheless, a lack of association does definitely imply a lack of causation, okay? And, and more, I think, relevant for this group, a lack of association does imply that there's a lack of a treatment effect for surgery on this group. Thanks very much. <laughs>